Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome back to our next webinar um, series in our series that we are having tonight. Um, thank you for joining the Kelly Gynecologic Oncology um, Service here at Johns Hopkins. And also tonight, we're doing in the first one of our webinars something new. So usually we pick a topic. It's something that has come from us, something that we sort of uh, developed over time, some things that we thought would be interesting to patients based on conversations and feedback. But this time really, this webinar is really the brainchild of three years ago or three and a half years ago. And an idea that when we were thinking about what topics we wanted to move on to or, or move through, um, that somebody had raised with us um, um, three years ago. So we're very lucky tonight that Kim Richardson and the GCT Facebook group is actually joining us to come together to partner on this topic. So um, we are obviously hosting them and very excited um, that they have joined us. They've sent us some questions that we're gonna be answering throughout the night. Um, hopefully they are joining our um, webinar and there's a chat a link and box, or if you're on the uh, GCT or the KGOS or the Kelly's Angels or however on Facebook uh, streaming, you have Facebook Living, uh, you have found us tonight. Um, welcome. And certainly there's opportunities to link in there and send questions and, and we can try to address those as well. Um, but we are very excited that all of you are here tonight, whether it is through KGOS or through um, the GCT, it is very nice to be able to partner with others and raise important topics. And I've done all that introduction and I haven't really emphasized that our important topic tonight is the first of what I hope will be many other series on rare tumors. And the rare tumor we're talking about is granulosa cell tumor since it is that partnership with GCT and specifically with Kim Richardson who brought this um, idea to us. So why don't we, um, that's enough of me introducing, why don't um, Kim and Dr. Fader um, why don't you each introduce yourselves? And Kim, do you want to go first? Tell us a little bit um, about yourself and your, your link to these topics. Well, thank you, Dr. Weddington. Um, yes, uh, I'm here in Chicago, born and raised, uh, was um, diagnosed with granuloso cell tumor, ovarian cancer in 2013. I uh, was told it was a cyst and actually was diagnosed during surgery. Um, through my treatment, I got involved in several support groups and through uh, one of the patient advocates, her name was Terry Geraci, I found our Facebook GCT group. And I can honestly say that even through my diagnosis, through treatment, through recovery, uh, my relationship, my personal relationship with my oncologist was not good. Uh, just trying to learn more about GCT, asking her questions before uh, infusions, just didn't seem to work out well for me. And there wasn't a lot of information on, on the internet at the time. It was mostly epithelial. So if you typed it in, it would tell you stuff like, well, you got five years survival rate and not understanding that my subtype was completely different. And so reaching out to that support group helped me to get those types of um, the support that I needed emotionally, intelligently, right? From women who uh, were beyond five year survivors for that matter. And, and they gave me hope. And as we've expanded over 1500, I give all the credit to our admins, Sue, uh, Kim, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking out on all the other folks who helped to support those 1500 women in learning more about granulosa cell tumor. And I just wanna to share tonight a little bit about my story and tell them and others about how they can get involved in patient advocacy. Thank you so much for bringing this to fruition. I just appreciate you all. Kimberly, it's such an honor to, uh, and Dr. Weddington, such an honor to be here with all of you. Good evening. Kimberly, I have a really important question for you. First of all, are you a Cubs fan or a White Sox fan? Uh-oh. I don't want to go to political party line. I, I, as a child, went to a lot of Cubs games and thought that I had such independence being able to get on the bus to go. But as I got older, I used I take my children to Sox games. So I okay, think I'm very good. Of a fair weather fan towards both. <laughs> I am originally from Illinois. I'm a diehard Cubs fan, but respect the Sox. But that's great. Um, 
Hi, everyone. I am Amanda Fader, as I uh, know some of you, and I uh, haven't met others. Um, I'm a G1 oncologist at Johns Hopkins. I was the division director of the program for several years, and now um, I'm the director of the rare tumor uh, GYN to rare tumor program at Hopkins and devote a lot of my research and my clinical work towards taking care of women who've been diagnosed with rare gynecologic ovarian and uterine cancers. Um, and I really am passionate about uh, research in this area as well. And I've always, um, I became an advocate for women with rare tumors in my training and fellowship in meeting women who were diagnosed with rare uterine cancers at the time and just bemoaning the fact that there just wasn't a lot of good trials or research dedicated to, to those women and that the treatment options, frankly, they sucked, they stunk. And, um, and that those women really, it was a very formidable experience in my training, um, a very formidable uh, formative time because, uh, you know, I wanted to make a difference and make an impact in that area and knew we could do better than this. And so actually my very first patient as, a, as an attending physician when I graduated and I came to Baltimore was a woman with a rare ovarian cancer. It was a low grade serous cancer actually. She was in Singapore, was a US attorney and had you know ties to Baltimore, came to Baltimore and we helped, we helped her. She had an advanced stage tumor and she lets me talk about this story. Her name is Erin. Um, and she's wicked smart. And together we did a lot of research on the existing literature and just again, bemoan the fact there was not a lot of evidence and that women like Erin and like Kimberly, you know, you were being lumped together in terms of statistics and in terms of clinical trials with women of all different types of cancers instead of personalizing the treatments and studying women exclusively who had unique cancers. And so I got very involved through Hopkins and then through the National Cancer Institute, um, through the Gynecologic Oncology Group and through what's called the NRG, which is our National Cooperative Group Clinical Trials Network on the Rare Tumor Committee there. And I'm fortunate to now head up or co-lead several rare tumor trials within the NCI that are national or international so that we can stop this one size fits all nonsense and really learn about how to best treat you as an individual. That's all. <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's a good intro and maybe we can just be done now. You guys kind of covered everything. <laughs> I'm obviously, I'm obviously, I'm obviously kidding. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit. So that's, I think that's a good sort of background on a little bit about rare tumors, what it means to be someone who has a rare tumor and some of the challenges you guys have touched on a, a few of them actually right off the bat, and then sort of why that leads to something that's important to advocate for, to speak up about, um, that uniqueness, which we all wanna be unique. It's always good to be unique, and yet there are challenges to being unique, and advocacy can be an antidote to that in some in some settings, and hopefully in, in this is one of them. So you mentioned that granulosa cell tumors are different. So ovary tumors are actually rare tumors. There aren't so many women who have ovarian cancer. So you're sort of already starting from a small group. I did a webinar with NOC a few weeks ago during Gynecologic Cancer Awareness Month, and it was on ovary cancer. And I sort of have to apologize to this crew here because I had to have a little caveat at the beginning, which is that as GYN oncologists, when we talk about ovary cancer, like we fall into really talking about epithelial ovary cancers. Um, so Dr. Fader, can you kind of explain to us what's the difference between the epithelial or the serous ovarian cancers that we all sort of lean to, towards and those high grade serous, which is really when we talk about ovary cancers, what we're, what we're sort of drop, we're sort of leaning into more than anything else. What's the difference between those high grade serous and a granulosa cell tumor? Like what is a granulosa cell tumor of the ovary exactly? That's a great question, Dr. Weathington. So there's typically three three types of cells described in an in the makeup of an ovary. The ovary is a remarkable organ, one of the most remarkable ever, um, and it does it has so many functions. And so the epithelial cells uh, constitute the surface cells of the ovary. And we think of our skin as epithelial, the lining of our mouth, a lot of the surface of of our organs and cells are constitute uh, constitute these types of epithelial cells. And these are what 
we know of as our common, more garden variety, albeit rare, as you said, Dr. Weddington, ovarian cancers like the high-grade serous cancers that constitute 70% of all ovary cancers. Then we have germ cell tumors where the eggs are housed and, and, and generated, remarkable cells, and, and equally remarkable cells, the sex cord stromal cells. These are the sexy cells that produce the hormones um, that help regulate egg production, egg release, menstrual cycles, just metabolism, and interact with a lot of other hormones, proteins, and organs in our body. And it's the granulosa cells that are the most common cell type of the sex cord stromal variety. And they, um, they produce different types of hormones and they help with estrogen production in our body. And we all know that estrogen is a really important female hormone that regulates a lot of different normal processes in our body from heart health to strong bone health, um, having libido and good sexual health, uh, metabolism, thyroid health, you name it. Um, but sometimes, you know, the granulosa cells, which are which normally do these things, can go awry and can grow abnormally or be stimulated to gr to, to growth in an atypical fashion. And these tumors can develop in those cells. So that is what we're talking about this evening. And Stephanie, it's interesting that you talked about it being a rare cancer. The ovarian cancer starts as out as this rare cancer. So it's a rare cancer amongst the cancers. And then we have rare cancers in some terms of subtypes. And then sometimes that we have patients, particularly women of color, who are even rarer inside the rare cancer of ovarian cancer. So it's, it's that challenge about how do we speak to uh, what we need in terms of research and what we need in terms of funding and what we need in terms of support. Yeah. Did you know, I know you mentioned that it, this all sort of started as a cyst on your ovary. Did right. you did you have symptoms, and if you don't mind sharing, and I- Oh, absolutely. So did you have symptoms that started? Zero. 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 The only risk factor that I feel I've learned over time was that I was over 35 and African-American and never pregnant. I have children that I've adopted, but I was never pregnant. Um, uh, no symptoms, no bloating, no spotting, no abdominal pain. I was training for the Chicago Marathon and just had what I considered uh, weird fatigue. And so I went back to my primary and we did a slew of tests from the head up to top of my head, bottom of my feet. Got to the pap smear, pap smear was abnormal, was not unusual for me. All of my pap smears were abnormal. And so when we got to the point uh, where they asked me to do a vaginal ultrasound, uh, they discovered what they thought was a cyst. So the head of gynecological, uh, the, the, our surgeon, our head surgeon was doing my surgery and we were going in to remove a cyst. In fact, I, as I like to, like to joke, I did a race the day before the surgery. It's just because I had no pain, uh, I felt fine. Didn't feel a cyst at all, didn't feel any of the things that some of my uh, Teal sisters are experiencing. Uh, so it was, it was pretty much a shock yeah. to wake up the next morning, uh, right? In the evening and be tapped on the shoulder to say, Kim, you have cancer. Yeah. It was like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, Kim, I came in here thinking this was a cyst. What are you all talking about? And I think from that day on, the, the record just kept skipping. You know, you have cancer, you have cancer for almost uh, 12 to 14 months. I, I don't think you're alone in that. You know, in my anecdotal experience, I don't know if Dr. Wellington could comment. I find that granulosa cell is the most common tumor you discover by accident or incidentally that's malignant in women who are undergoing like a hysterectomy or, you know, another type of gynecologic surgery and, and you're just not anticipating it. And that's what makes it sneaky. <laughs> Um, but on the on the flip side, uh, one of the reasons for that is that it grows quite a bit more slowly. It's more what we call more indolent than some of the. Does it make it any less important to study? And it, it can be risky and life threatening. But but it, it it at least affords us an opportunity to you know to treat it in a different way and study it in, in a in, and catch it potentially much earlier. And most granulosa cell tumors, for that reason, are diagnosed at an earlier stage than. 
um, than tumors of the epithelial origin or, or, or even, you know, in some of the germ cell tumors as well. You know, it's something interesting. One of the questions that came from, from GCT was about screening and why we don't screen women with ultrasounds to find these tumors. So we're talking about asymptomatic, we're talking about an ovary tumor that to both your points by personal experience, by anecdote and comparing to friends and by medical experience, doesn't have a lot of symptoms. So why don't we just give everybody a pelvic ultrasound, Dr. Fader? Are you sure you don't want to answer that question, Dr. Bennington? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll probably both answer it, but yeah, so, so ladies, we're not trying to uh, keep you from cancer prevention here. There's a good reason why we don't use the transvaginal ultrasound as a solo tool for screening. And it's because in the very large, there've been very large screening trials done looking at ultrasound, looking at ultrasound plus blood, blood markers for ovarian cancer like the CA125. And interestingly, one of the biggest studies they found that in order to diagnose one ovarian cancer, you had to operate on 19 other women uh, who had benign disease and didn't end up needing surgery in order to detect that one cancer. So the sensitivity of the ultrasound and actually detecting a cancer was really, really poor. And the risk factors, the more what we call the morbidity or the complication rate um, in women who underwent unnecessary surgery was pretty high. So, so we've we know that ultrasound is important for sure. We, uh, you know, but we, but not as a standalone tool. And right now, um, ovarian cancer screening is really aimed at not only imaging modalities like ultrasound, but looking at potential blood markers. Or we're we're also studying a Pap smear in our institution um, that may detect the genetic material in the cancer cells or the DNA. Um, that may be shed by the ovarian tumors into the uterus or into the vagina or into the bloodstream. And so really, I think the future of ovarian cancer screening, which is really being studied closely at Hopkins and many other centers is in what we call mutational diagnostics. Can we identify the genetic signature or the DNA signature of a particular tumor and find it easily in, in the bloodstream or in, the, you know, in, the, in a pap smear of a woman? Now, when, they, when I noted a lot of the, our research is moving us toward uh, most of ovarian cancer cells are found in the fallopian tubes. What types of blood tests, tumor tests, screenings could be done from that vantage point? If we, if we don't think vaginal ultrasounds will be uh, reliable right. and right. verifiable, what could we be doing? What is science doing in relationship to the fallopian tube in terms of screening? So it's a really great point you brought up. So that more common epithelial cell cancer, the high-grade serous variety we were talking about earlier, studies at Johns Hopkins at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and other centers have identified that most ovarian cancers actually aren't ovarian cancers. They start in the fallopian tube, which is that little trumpet-like organ that sits right next to and, and is married to the ovary and helps deliver the egg to its intended place in the uterus. And they start at that little feathery, trumpety type end of the part that the fallopian tube wraps around the ovary. So 90% of all of what we know as ovarian cancers actually are, are fallopian tube cancers, we theorize. Not so for granulosa cell tumors, right? We know those start in the ovary themselves are one of the 10% of tumors that do. But to your question, and, and Dr. Weddington, please, please feel free to step in. Um, where, this is where mutational diagnostics, I think, is going to be very useful. We know that fallopian tube cancers shed. Um, these cells shed very readily. And so I actually diagnosed, we had a woman who came to see me um, from Texas the other day, and she, um, she ended up having an abnormal pap smear. She had cancer in her pap smear, and we thought maybe she had a cervical or uterine cancer. It ended up being a fallopian tube cancer. So we're looking at, again, pap smear or vaginal site technology or doing a wash in the uterus to try to detect cells versus detecting the, those cells or the, the fragments of those cells in the bloodstream. And we're a long way off from being main, you know, ready for prime time and marketing this, but there's a lot of progress being made in these screening cancer in screening tests. Well, then I, I, I still want to push this a bit because I think then if, if we are differentiated between 
epithelial and GCT where ours is truly on the ovary, then I, I would want to talk to NCCN and change some of the guidelines around the ultrasound. If it, if it in fact gives us more information about GCT. And I just don't see why it wouldn't, I still don't see why it wouldn't be a standard operating procedure, like the next step uh, for, for pap smears. And then if you don't have GCT, beautiful. You know, we, you can move on to, to the next subtype, uh, but just trying to find the origin of some of these cancer cells, I think would, I think it would give a, a little bit more hope because we don't have that, that, um, that space between uh, the biopsy and the diagnosis. It's straight to surgery. Yeah. Dr. Ways, did you want to say something or do you want me to answer that? No, no, no. You, you can go ahead. I, I was, I mean, I think you touched on a lot of, um, or you touched on something I think that is so core to all of us who treat cancers is, is if we could actually go back three steps and prevent the cancer that, you know, or catch it even earlier, that is always the number one priority. And I think what is always hard um, is to sort of place that idea, those surge, those 19 surgeries that Dr. Fader talked about, like all those false, po you know, false positives that we get are such a challenge too. And so I think to, to your point, we need actually, Kim, something better than the ultrasound. We do need something better than an ultrasound because an ultrasound doesn't, doesn't get us to a good diagnosis. Um, we need some combination of a blood test, a vaginal smear, you know, some other thing to get us there. And then I think in the meantime, to your point, you mentioned, you know, your, your doctor and you sort of worked head to toe to figure out what was going on. And I think a lot of us who treat ovary cancers spend a lot of time sort of validating that we know our bodies. And so sometimes it's really a matter of that validation, that validation and that, that assuredness that you know your body is incredibly important in a setting where we don't yet, yet being operative, have the technology to land us where we want to be. Is that a fair? Go ahead, Dr. Fader. No, I, I appreciate everything you just said. And Kimberly, the struggle is real. We, we know that this the screening is really lacking right now. It's non-existent right now, unless we're dealing with women with no mutations who are high risk. And we, we kind of put those kind of women in a different bucket because we know that they have a 40 to 50% risk of developing a cancer. But we, we also know, you know that women with granulosa cell tumor can um, overexpress the you know, inhibin B, which is, which is produced normally by the granulosa cells. So to be honest, we just really need to look at whether combinations of strategies like looking at those specific tumor markers in the bloodstream plus ultrasound or other modalities would make more sense here. But when we're dealing, I will say that what, and I don't have to tell a lot of women on this call, but um, one of the hallmarks to tell us that a granulosa cell tumor might be there is a woman may experience abnormal menstrual bleeding. Mm -hmm. And that's because we know these, these cell, these tumors pr produce an excess of estrogen and that excess estrogen is good, but too much, just like, you know, cake, you know, too much mm -hmm. is, is not good. And, and it can lead to, you know, excess growth of the menstrual lining and that can lead to abnormal bleeding symptoms. So in that sense, with with the garden variety, and I'm not, I'm not trying to compare one up any one cancer survivor situation, but it is um, it is helpful for us as providers and for women to know that you know that, that there's an, an abnormal symptom that usually will help us detect an early stage tumor in that when there's abnormal bleeding. And I think one of the things we try to really ram down women <laughs> women's throats and, and teach the community is just doesn't matter what your age is, if you have irregular bleeding, you know, if you feel something, say something, go to your doctor, get it checked out because it could be nothing. It could be the sign of a tumor. And, and so that is one of the most important messages we try to tell women in the granulosa cell community. Yeah, Dr. Weatherton, as we sort of trans, uh, you, know, you know, go through all the questions that other people have, 
yeah. I wanted to you know, really sort of put out there this whole concept between the, the importance of having a gynecological oncologist do your surgery, the importance of how for GCT, mm -hmm. uh, how important it is the way it was extracted from the body. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we see consistently throughout our support group is everyone's first question is, was it taken out intact? Was it taken out intact? And, you know, and so, you know, to hear the stories, these heartbreaking stories of women who say it burst, it burst through surgery. You know, can we talk to and help people understand, you know, because so many people don't have access to a great teaching institution. Mm -hmm. Now, trust, my oncologist was not the nicest human being, but you know, I give her kudos for her surgical skill because it got me eight years of survivorship because of the way she took it out. So could we, you know, somewhere in there, can we weave in how we address these issues around recurrence as well as the surgical procedures that relate to that recurrence? Yeah, and if absolutely. any studies have been done around that. Yeah, no, absolutely. We can sort of, I think it's a good point to transition. You know, we sort of often, when we talk about cancers, we start with prevention and early diagnosis, and then we move on to treatment. So I think it, you sort of gave us a perfect segue, and that was in my in my list of things I wanted to cover next. And if we just generally, I mean, you, you sort of outlined it, Kim, surgery. It is a mainstay of surgery, of treatment. The mainstay of surgery. It's a mainstay of treatment for granulosa cell tumors. And Dr. Fader, you mentioned earlier the word indolent. And I think, you know, things that grow indolently lend themselves to being removed. Um, the technique issues that, that Kim's talking about, Dr. Fader, what, where do those technique issues come into play? And how many times can surgery be an option for someone with granulosa cell tumor? Where does, where does surgery fit in the whole spectrum of treatment for for women? These are great questions. So surgery is probably the most important therapy we offer women with granulosa cell tumors. And that is because, as you said, um, Dr. Weathington, you know, because of their tumor biology and their, their growth patterns, they are amenable to surgery, especially when performed by experts. Um, the goal with surgery, whether it's early stage or, or we find disease outside of the ovary is to remove all of the grossly visible tumors to, 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 uh, to hope for the best result. However, I myself, and I've done granulosa cell surgery countless times as, as Dr. Wethington, because we're a rare tumor center. Um, I have myself encountered situations where we were not able to remove the tumor intact. And, you know, I've treated several young, very young women who I didn't know had a, had a granulosa cell tumor as you didn't, Kimberly, you know, and, and we were, you know, I'm not going to perform a full ovarian removal in a 17 year old when, it, you know, it's not clearly a cancer on imaging. And so I have found myself as, as experienced as I am, it happens and it's okay. I, and I, I'll tell you, in most cases, it ends up being okay as long as um, it's recognized and all of the tumor is removed and a plan is made after surgery to, you know, to address that. And in some cases, surveillance without any additional treatment is considered reasonable, and sometimes we offer treatment. But, you know, we can only we can only move forward from our current situations. And you know, whether you had a tumor that was removed intact and you had the perfect surgery with the perfect surgeon or not, granulosa cell tumor recurrences in many cases, in the vast majority of cases are what we call salvageable. We can make it right again. We can help put women in remission again, sometimes through surgery alone, sometimes with a combination of surgery and other therapies. And most women will enjoy pretty long survival outcomes um, with the right approach. So just a few things that you just mentioned, which I think we hadn't said earlier, which is an important thing about granulosa cell tumors is the age at diagnosis can often be much younger women. So we talk about epithelial ovarian cancers and most of our friends who have epithelial ovarian cancers are maybe about 60, 61, 62, right around 60 when they're diagnosed in, in general. Whereas in the case of granulosa cell tumors, those ages are younger and over a much broader range, 
which I think to Dr. Fader's point is how these sometimes end up coming out not um, not with the whole ovary, but but a cyst as as a cyst. Um, you mentioned other therapies. Um, what about hormone therapy? Is there a role for hormone therapy in granulosa cell tumors? Yes. <laughs> <That's the> answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it, this is something I study a lot, and uh, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I really like using hormone or what we call endocrine therapies. There really are sort of anti hormone therapies. We're blocking hormone receptors in most of these approaches. Um, and the reason that this is a very, you know, potentially useful treatment in, in these tumors is because most granulosa cell tumors will express, richly express these estrogen receptors, right? Just normally in the normal cells and in the tumors, they overexpress these cells, meaning there's, there's too many of them. And so they can be stimulated by estrogen. So using anti-estrogens, anti-progesterones and, 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 and or anti production of estrogens, you know, um, sort of like before it gets to estrogen, can we block the pathway a little bit earlier in the process, um, really has a lot of clinical utility with these tumors. The reason I also like these kinds of treatments, they're not innocuous for, by any means. And I know that some, some treatments like aromatase inhibitors, like letrozole and astrozole have their share of side effects, but by and large, these side effects are much more tolerable than chemotherapy or radiation treatments. And women can actually remain on them in some case months to years. Um, but the side effects are real and we do help women with them and they can cause other untoward <laughs> effects like, you know, can I thin out your bones a little bit or cause some joint pain and elevate your cholesterol levels. We gotta keep an eye on all those things and help maintain the overall general health status. Um, but I use hormone therapy a, a ton in the treatment of women with this disease. And I think to your point, you can, you know, a nice thing about the hormone therapy is you can switch it up. You can go from one to another, you can revisit. There's sort of a lot of, um, a lot of art to manipulating uh, with, the, with the hormone therapy that makes it nice. And that was one of the questions. Can you switch hormone therapies or once you use one, can you no longer use hormone therapy? And there's a lot of flexibility there. And you mentioned bone health. And that's actually also another question that someone asked about, are there ways to counteract the bone effects of the letrozole? Yeah, to me, for me, that's the toughest, you know, long-term side effect for women because it's very important to have healthy bone structure and prevent bone falls and bone fractures. Um, so calcium and vitamin D, daily calcium and vitamin D, no matter what you eat is really important in, in women. Um, you know, weight bearing exercise is, is equally important and, and just keeping a close eye through what we, what we use the DEXA scans every, you know, I usually will scan women every two years. I don't do it too much more often than that because it takes time for bone health to, to deteriorate and you don't want to expose women to too much radiation. So um, every two years I think is reasonable and, you know, starting women on a, what's called bisphosphonate therapy, if, if there are signs of thinning of bones, you know, to kind of counteract that or slow the bone loss down can be very helpful. So you mentioned hormone therapy. I think both of us have revealed some of our biases towards surgery and towards hormone therapy. Do you ever use chemotherapy in granulosa cell tumors? Yeah, sure. Um, so I tend to, I, I, my bias is, uh, tends to be towards the, the newer uh, type of um, chemotherapy agents, the bio, what we call the biologics. Um, one of them being Avastin or Bevacizumab, we call it Bev. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this drug. Um, it blocks, um, it, it basically blocks new blood vessel formation in tumors. Um, and there was a phase two clinical trial performed showing, I think over an 80%, what we call clinical benefit rate in women with recurrent granulosa cell tumors who use this drug. And this is a drug that's administered IV every three weeks, but super, super well tolerated other than some high blood pressure um, and occasionally can increase the risk of, of bleeding or clotting. So we have to be careful. But overall, we have I've had many patients with granulosa cell tumor on these drugs for many years. Um, so the side effect profile is usually really good. And the, what I mean by clinical benefit rate in the, in the clinical trial is women either experience a, a shrinkage of their tumors or stabilization of their tumor growth. Um, and so 
yes, and there's also chemotherapy can be used. There's a very large trial that I think was closed, unfortunately, comparing standard conventional chemotherapy agents that have been around for decades. And um, unfortunately, we didn't get enough people over, around the world onto these trials, I think because of the bias reflected in GYN oncologists and medical oncologists now that we think that some of these newer agents may be may be working a little bit more in a more unique and targeted fashion for these tumors. But I do consider using chemotherapy absolutely if I have exhausted several of these other opportunities. What about you, Dr. Weddington? What I I, I very similarly think we always start with surgery in my last month. This is a very fitting topic for me because in my own personal practice this month, there's been a lot of, of GCT. Um, and we I very much think that the start is, is the surgery piece for sure. And then figuring out where to use hormones and the biologics. And someone asked some very astute questions about targeted agents because to get to the topic of research and our understanding of granulosa cell tumors, we now do have a much better understanding about some of the, the mutations that can be present. And probably the one that um, everybody, um, everybody may know or may not know, but certainly from a um, publicity New England Journal of Medicine kind of, of, of shout it from the treetops, um, finding is that many, 97%, I think they quote, um, granulosa cell tumors have a, have a Fox L2 mutation. So can we, target that yet, Dr. Fader? I know the answer to that question, which is why I say it with like a little little tear here in my eye. But we're, we're stuck on one. We clearly know FOXL2 is important diagnostically. FOXL2 is an important gene protein in the granulosa cell. We do not yet have a compelling, what we call actionable target here in terms of having identified an antibody that can target this particular, uh, this particular uh, protein, but um, but I know that researchers are actively working on this. And this is typically found, as you said, in the adult GCTs. Yeah. They're not typically seen in the juvenile GCT that we might see in younger women. Yeah. So for women who have granulosa cell tumors then who are interested in clinical trials, sort of what is your approach? I, ha I have my approach. But what's your approach for how you find women clinical trials? Because you mentioned there was one, there was one, and it was very hard to accrue because I think we all have the bias of if you can take it out, take it out. So it made it very hard to enroll on that, on that trial. But the information is certainly needed. So when you have a patient who wants to discuss, you know, clinical trials or what's next, or what can I do that targets my tumor? What's your approach to finding opportunities or how do you think about and answer that question? Yeah, it's a great question. Clinical trials are so important to advancing our understanding of disease and improving therapies and survival for women. And although I think some women may be squeamish about trials or not have a full understanding of what does it mean? Am I gonna be a guinea pig? Is, is it going to benefit me personally or just someone down the road? These are all really legitimate questions. And I like to, I know you and I feel similarly about demystifying this for women. And we'll tell you that bar none, you know, going to centers where clinical trials are offered results in better survival for women because we can offer you more options for treatment. And, at, and with GCT, I tend to offer clinical trials after we've um, you know, exhausted at least two or three rounds of surgery and standard therapies that we know work well, because that's always gonna be your best bet to go with a given or a known therapy in terms of your outcome and how to sustain a great survival. Um, but if I've gotten to a point with a woman where we've, you know, either she's interested in clinical trials or we think, you know, some of the remaining therapies we have may not be perfect. Let's investigate other things. We can send a woman's tumor for what's called NGS testing or next generation sequence <clears throat> testing to determine if she has specific mutations or abnormalities in her in her DNA, in the DNA of the tumor, excuse me, that we can target with known, um, known drugs or targeted therapies. That's why they call targeted therapies because you target specific mutations or you target specific receptors or proteins in a cell. And yes, um, in some cases I have found mutations in the PIK3 kinase um, you know, region um, where we can, we can use um, you know, specific therapies there, um, mTOR inhibitors and, and, and other therapies 
I have found um, MEK inhibitors useful in this setting, depending on whether they have you know, specific BRAF or other mutations. Um, and many other, there are also mutations you can check in women that one of our colleague, Dr. Stephanie Gayard studies, when a woman might develop resistance to like an aromatase inhibitor, like an, an astrozole or letrozole, it's not the end of the line for hormone therapy by any means. We actually do run a test on the tumor for what's called an ESR1 or estrogen receptor alpha one mutation that can, in breast cancer, has demonstrated um, significant resistance to aromatase inhibitor, but certain hotspot mutations confer sensitivity to other types of hormone therapy like fulvestrant, which is another anti-estrogen, exemestane, tamoxifen, or a combination of some of those drugs. Like can, you can combine you know, an mTOR inhibitor with fulvestrant and do, you know, and this is where I find rare tumor clinical work so meaningful is that, you know, we're not just, we're not doc in the boxes here. We're, we're working with the patient together to be creative and artistic and personalizing the treatment and, and working together with them to see what, what are you willing to do and to work with me on, you know, can we find something specific for you? So that, that's sort of how, so how I approach it. Yeah. I think that, you know, when you're in a, when you have a rare tumor and you're finding a home, I think in the cancer world, you know, we call them bucket trials, these trials that are, that are geared towards a target as opposed to a cancer type. It may be an opportunity for, you know, finding another home in addition to the GCT home, but, you know, a home and a location based on the mutation that your tumor might have that you may, you know, may find uh, yourself looking at. And actually one of the questions we got, Kim, which I think is a, a really great question somebody posted and said to Kim specifically, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and being such a wonderful advocate. And then ask the question, you know, to research, do you have any messages directly asked of you? Do you have any messages or words of wisdom for researchers? I do. I have more than words. <laughs> more than words. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to go back and just say to Dr. Peters and Dr. Reddington that this type of discussion is so important for that woman, for that patient that does not have this relationship with their oncologist. Mm -hmm. I can personally account to being told to take BEP. I did research on BEP. I said, I think it's a little bit too harsh. Personally, I don't even understand why I'm doing chemo. This is a slow growing tumor. <laughs> Chemos are fast growing tumors. Explain it. The answer I got was BEP is better. So I say, this is the reason why I advocate. Because to do this kind of work, with the patient-centered type oncologists, physicians, and researchers is so important to the patient. Whether they are the type that want to put their heads in the sand and just say, just do, I'll do whatever you tell me, or to the person that's a little bit more like me, like type A, who wants to understand what's happening to her body. She deserves the type of oncologist that will explain it. So I'm just sitting here just want to do backflips as I listen to Dr. Fader just break the science down in easy to understand language. And so to answer the question regarding advocacy, I, it is more than words for me at this point. I've been able to have the most dynamic relationship with the University of Illinois Cancer Center. And I know our director is on the line and that just shows the amount of support he has for me as a patient advocate, that he would be here tonight. Um, I've been able to forge partnerships with MD, PhD students to break down the basics of scientific inquiry and put those into modules and just say, what's a hypothesis? You know, why do we look at posters? Why do we go to these conferences like ASCO or to OCRA or to uh, SGO and learn more about research? Why do we go to, to uh, Capitol Hill, uh, decked out in our teal, to talk about increasing funding for cancer research, and we don't understand it at a very fundamental level. So that's my lane, right? I've been through every level of advocacy. I started out in awareness advocacy after tr after treatment, and I came in full blown like, "Hey, I'm a you know I'm a marathoner." ultra marathon, I know a lot of people, let's get some money behind this. 
I said, I really want to focus on African-American awareness. And was going, they went, hey, hold it. The data doesn't bear that out. And so that took me aback. I'm like, I can't be a part of something that doesn't recognize me as a data point, right? So I started to look around advocacy in places that were meaningful, uh, that, that spoke to me in terms of how I could communicate about uh, granuloso cell tumor and to, to not take anything away from epithelial or that tremendous amount of advocacy that's been built up over years, but to shine a light on some of these subtypes. And so I focus, start focusing and drilling down and what would make us be seen and actually be heard? And what's gonna do that is education and training. And so if we can start with like scientific inquiry and then understand a lot more about GCT and then uh, a lot more about the modalities, then when we do, you know, flag our, our ribbon, right? Mm -hmm. And go to, uh, to speak to researchers, uh, to talk to people like Dr. Kielieski at UIC, about the importance of moving the needle for patient advocates and to get us in a relationship where we understand the cancer research, then there's shared decision-making in our treatment. That's common sense. So that's, I hope I, I, hope I went to the, the answer uh, to that question, but that's the thing that I'm the most passionate about. Uh, and, and during this journey, meeting people like Dr. Fader, meeting people and getting the opportunity to be now on a gynecological disease team where I look at clinical trials and their accrual process and I can share the patient perspective. Uh, when I get on tumor board, you ain't gonna be able to tell me nothing. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> when I get on the tumor board, it's over. I, I have something to say. So I appreciate it. Can you join our tumor boards? I think, I think we would learn a lot from you, Kimberly. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. We need to be more rare aware. We need to make people more rare aware. And, and you're extre extremely inspirational. Like this is, this is what, why we do what we do, you know, because we, we, you know, my mother had, not a GYN cancer, she had bone marrow cancer when I was 19, and it was the most important experience in my life and led me to go into oncology. And I knew I wanted to take care of women because there's not enough research being done in women. And you mentioned it, outcomes for women who are black, Hispanic, you know, we know that outcomes in cancer care are suboptimal, whether you have a rare cancer or not. And we don't understand the biology of that. And, and so there's so much work to be done and so much funding of this work that needs to be done. And we love partnering with women like you, Kimberly, and your organization, because I think we're stronger together. You know, you need the research and the science and the clinical piece. You need the humanistic piece and the face of GCT is you and, and women like you. And that's what, why, why we do what we do. 1,400 women sitting inside of a Facebook bubble. Yeah, that can be talked to and in, uh, put inside of clinical trials and trained and they could be on DOD review boards for GCT. Uh, they could be a part of the research designs, uh, NCI for trials. Uh, you know, th th we have this rich living experience yeah. and it matters. Mm -hmm. And if we can just give them a little bit of supplementation in terms of the language you all speak and the researchers speak, then imagine what we could do with all of that collective brain thought in one room. That's the, the impos that's just the possibilities are endless. Yeah. It's the holy grail. That's the holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we sort of mentioned it's indolent, but we also talked about the fact that this tumor comes back um, and there were some questions, actually, some really good questions. One, one patient asked about cystic versus solid granulosa cell tumors, and do they behave differently? And um, someone asked about why, when, once it comes back, why does it seem to be more aggressive each time my cancer comes back? And so, Dr. Feder, even within granulosa cell tumors, are there, are there differences Yes, absolutely. We know that there's differences 
they're not well understood. I, I, I've anecdotally found more cystic uh, granulosa tumors in younger women and not in, uh, of the adult or the juvenile type. And they can, you know, just like in Kimberly may mimic a, just a plain old, you know, follicular ovarian cyst because, you know, these, that's what they look like. And, and so they're, they're the great mimic mimickers in that regard. Um, I don't have a good understanding yet of what those differences confer in terms of outcome. I don't know if you do, but th that's something that we're definitely studying. So, yeah, no, I agree. I definitely don't. And it recently sort of somebody asked a question that I've recently been spending a little bit of time on PubMed trying to, to figure out is um, why do they become more aggressive? And, and my inquiry was really focused on like, what new mutations do they develop? Like we know right. the FOXL2 is a driver mutation. And when we use that language, we're talking about kind of the start, right? The, it drives the bus that starts the, can the cancer. But then like what happens later on that it gets more aggressive? And so um, I, I've actually been looking back, trying to figure out like, you know, complex sequencing of all these recurrences because a lot of women have multiple surgeries. So we should have all these, these tumors to look at. And there's a lot of interesting sort of science questions that, uh, that folks are asking and, and I wish we knew the answers to tell you, but they're good to, to, to Kim's point, there are good areas of research and things that when you start to put the, the questions and the science together, have a lot of, a lot of possibility and a lot of room for research. There's yeah. one. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I love what you said. Um, well, I hate that it happens, but I love what you said about tumors change and mutate and our own normal cells change and mutate as we age, right? That's why cancers mostly occur later in life because our cells go through so many cycles of cell division and, you know, copying themselves exactly. And that copying process with the DNA is so sophisticated, and intricate that mutations can occur and tumors just get, they're smart and they, they, you know, uh, they figure out ways to overcome the therapies they're being exposed to in developing resistance mechanisms. And we don't completely understand that. So, yeah, I think that's very true. One treatment modality that, that uh, one of the questions was about that we haven't mentioned is radiation. And the question yeah. was about cyber knife, which is a, yeah. a very, you know, the, the term gets, gets used a lot and it's really, I, I would, describe it, Dr. Fader, correct me if you think I'm not doing a decent job describing it, but as targeted. So cyber knife is like a very specific knife-like application of the radiation. Radiation often can be a broader area. Um, so what is, what are, what's our knowledge of the role of radiation for granulosa cell tumors? That's a great question, really understudied, less studied than targeted therapies or hormone therapies. However, it certainly has its applications. And in women who may have an isolated or regional, what we call regional recurrence, where it's just in one spot, but it might be a really tricky spot to remove surgically, or we've used a lot of other therapies or a patient's really symptomatic, and we know we can't get all of the disease out, um, you know, radiation definitely can serve a purpose in that in that setting. And I've definitely used that, especially when there's a pelvic recurrence. Um, and I've maybe already operated on a patient three or four times where it's really wrapped around a blood vessel. And I think it would be too dangerous to, to go after surgically. You know, I, I think that's something reasonable to consider. How, what do you think, Dr. Weddington? No, I agree. I think that blood vessel description is exactly when I most <laughs> think about it is when the location is, it, you know, it, it's one location. And it's a location that we really just surgically is not, not feasible. And blood vessels are the one, the one we really think about. And somebody actually asked about location of metastasis with granulosa cell versus the epithelials. Um, and I think that um, we've actually in, in some, like just to answer, answer that question real quick, we've, we've touched on that. It tends to be a more focal recurrence or isolated recurrence. It doesn't tend to be the grains of sand over lots of things that can happen with the epithelial, which is part of, in addition to the indolent nature, what makes it multiple surgically possible to resect it is that it's not coming back in 24 places at a time. It's coming back in one or two often, not always, but often, which is what makes it, um, often repeatedly amenable to, to surgery. Dr. Weather thing really quickly though, when it when it doesn't uh, when the ovary bursts, 
Mm -hmm. and cells spill into the abdominal cavity. I find that interesting that you would say that it doesn't sort of metastasize across, but that it, even though it's all these cells that are spilled into the abdominal cavity, we still find it a way for, it's kind of smart if that's the case, that even though it would spill into the cavity, it still finds a way to find itself to a very focal, specific space within the, in the, within the body. Yeah. So I, it's a very good question. Somebody asked about the, the bags and why surgically we don't always put cysts in bags. And I think this gets to that a little bit. It's all kind of the same thing, the question of spillage. And I think even with there's sort of the rupture of the cyst kind of spillage and then the, the fracturing, there's different, when we break it down, there's different kinds of spillage. And I do think, Kim, in, in the situation you're describing when there's multiple fragments, so to speak, that is where it can end up in more than one place. So okay. it's not that it never does. It's just that it's not, it's, it's more typical tendency. The more common tendency is to come back in sort of one place and then take that out. And then many years later, another place and take that out in another place and another place. It, uh, it lends its, it, that's sort of generally how it behaves. You're right. That's not always accurate, but that's, um, and certainly somebody asked about them becoming, you know, the grain of cell becoming more aggressive as time goes on. And that is where too, that isolated recurrence can switch from sort of being an isolated process to a multifocal. And somebody asked just, I'm gonna clip through questions real yeah. quick um, because I don't wanna totally miss them because um, there are definitely some good ones. They're definitely, just to answer a few questions that I think are easy and fast to answer. Tell me if I'm wrong, Dr. Fader, um, but, Following radiation therapy, there are other therapies to try. Um, absolutely, you can do any of this systemic hormone, targeted therapies, chemotherapies afterwards. Somebody asked about carbotaxol, also a very reasonable. And actually, I think Dr. Fader, the trial you were mentioning may have been a trial looking at, at um, carbotaxol as one treatment option, if I remember correctly what you were mentioning. Yes. Um, so I think we have covered all of our Oh, actually, very important question. Dr. Fader, how do you find a gynoc who specializes in granulosa cell tumors? Or Kim, how did you, you switched. Actually, Dr. Fader, you don't get to answer this question. I take it back. <laughs> Kim, it's your turn. <laughs> Kim, you switched GYN oncologists, which many people do, by the way. I think Dr. Fader and I would both say, like, first opinions, second opinions, people move. You have granulosa cell tumors often for, you know, 10, 12, 20, 30 years. And, um, and so you're not necessarily living in the same place, but, but you switched um, gynox. How did you find someone who had a lot of experience or grain, with granulosa cell tumor? What would you tell someone to seek out when they're looking for a new GYN oncologist? Well, I'll tell you really quickly. Uh, for four months, I was in chemo. Uh, every uh, infusion, I had a visit with my oncologist. And every infusion, I walked into my chair with... Uh, you know, crying. And my chemo nurse, God bless Amanda, because she eventually just whispered in my ear, I'm gonna help you find a new oncologist. Mm -hmm. Because I was so sad every single time I went into infusion, because 10 minutes ago I asked a question and got shot down or whatever. And so my, my biggest advice is, Ladies uh, and gentlemen, because uh, there are transgender men who have ovarian cancer. So we have to be very careful about the way, you know, words matter. But at the end of the day, follow your heart. Every follow single time I went into infusion. Because 10 minutes ago, I asked a question and got shot down or whatever. Oh, I think I'm so going back. My biggest advice back. is. What I'm saying is going back. And gentlemen, because uh, there are transgender men who have ovarian cancer so we yeah okay so i uh, know i think it's just the recording but uh the bottom line is I, I i stress if something in your in your as they say in your gut is telling you that you're not getting what you need from this person don't make it personal move on this is about your life it's not about this once in a moment, four month relationship with this physician. It's a, it's a physician for everybody. 
That's all. I, I, that's the way I look at it. And I didn't know enough about the cancer, but thank God that there were health professionals around me that showed me that, like, with, with my own chemo nurse who just said, "Kim, you can switch." And I was like, "I can." And so, I, I still feel like you know, if we saw each other at a conference. I would bow down with the deepest respect because I said before, eight years, no remission from granulosal cell tumor. But it is important for shared decision-making. It's important that there's a language in an oncology that is uh, nurtured and that we learn to speak. We learn again the humanity within cancer to learn how to just talk to this, this, this person who is, is in this room that you've never met before, that now knows they have a diagnosis. Uh, and just remember that. I understand the other side of it for oncologists, the whole click, uh, you know, hospital administration management stuff about who you can see, get them in, get them out. You know, that I get that piece, but that 10 minutes has gotta be meaningful. So for a patient, if you don't feel that that connection is there for you, where you can ask questions, where you don't feel like you're being condescended to, that you don't feel like you're being disrespected, that you feel like you're being heard, heard about your thoughts, heard about your feelings, heard about what's happening to you during treatment. Keep it moving. That's the best way I can say it. It's not personal. Keep it moving. You know, yeah. find somebody new. You're not gonna hurt that. Uh, you're not gonna hurt that oncologist's feelings yeah. because second opinions are out there, and you could go with a second opinion. So nobody's feelings is gonna be hurt. You know, so it's not personal. Do what's best for you. And I think if you don't have a chemo nurse who whispers in your ear, and you're trying, because that's that's your that was lucky that you had somebody who was like, actually, I know somebody who specializes in granulosa cell. Let me let me make a link for you. I think finding that link can be hard. And I think if you're somebody who isn't somewhere where that's available, I think um, I definitely did not say this. I, I say this sometimes uh, in the operating room and to my kids. I did not say this. Do not repeat this to anybody. But this may be the one time that going to Dr. Google may be okay <laughs> to Google. Or join our Facebook group. Or join your faith. That's right. Ask on the Facebook group. Oh, I'm sorry. I need to keep better making answer. plugs. I, I, that's right. Better answer. Plugs. Dr. That, Facebook group. Sorry, Kim. That's there the are 1,400 answer. women in that group that possibly have 1,400 different oncologists. That's exactly right. No, that's exactly right. And that will lead you. That's that's a perf That's a better answer, Kim. Thank you. So the GCT <laughs> group, or um, certainly Dr. Fader would say, you know, we have on our website that we run a rare tumor center. And I know I can I can think of you know many other institutions across the country that similarly do. So ask on the GCT website. You can probably find videos of a lot of us online so you can learn something about us before you go um, but there are there are resources um, out there and available and um, and lots of lots of possibility lots of possibility I promised we wouldn't go over I failed but only by three minutes so not too not too badly um, I just want to extend a thank you to Kim and to the entire GCT community that is on to everybody who asked questions and um, I'm going to do my best to go back through and any question that we didn't get to. I tried to at least get to everybody in, to, in some capacity. So um, we'll go back through the questions and make sure that any that didn't get answered that we do um, answer them. And um, certainly it has been a pleasure. Um, I've enjoyed greatly um, getting to spend the last hour with the two of you. So thank you, thank you. Thank you to Kim for three years ago saying, hey, I have this family a GCT Facebook group, and I'd like to, to join you to talk about issues that are important to us. So thank you for saying that three years ago. Thank you for being patient. And um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. So have a good evening, everybody. Bye-bye.